There's a deathless beauty about a landscape we love, which the seasons revive year after year. Generations of our kind have left their mark on this place, but nature continues to exert its power, and we can share all that it has to offer. Some words are magic. The name Dartmoor has the somber feel of granite about it. This last great wilderness of England is also the heart of Devon, with tours rising to 2,000 feet and vast expanses of bog and heather where rivers like the Dart, Tor, Teen and Tavy are born. There are 365 square miles of upland, and looking up from my South Devon birthplace, I can see this huge rock, Haytor, standing in the sky. It remains a fabulous statement of the unattainable. The moors can be a subtle marriage of light and silence, honeycombed with lark song. It's also hill farming and the prehistoric past, the scars of tin mining, wildlife, tourism, and the weather. Here, the weather is everything, and its moods are swift and unpredictable. A gentle stillness may be followed by punishing storms. Weather has helped shape the tours, which give the landscape its distinctive character. Almost every hill has its broken granite outcrop, battered by time and the weather. They have acquired names which make them part of moorland mythology. Barman's Nose, Black Tor, Fox Tor, Vixen Tor, Hound Tor, Devil's Tor, Saddle Tor. There's a noticeable contrast between the North and South Moors with their large blanket bogs. The South is rounded, exposed, braided with prehistoric remains and all the mystery that goes with symbols of the lost past and more recent industrial history. The high, rugged North is a washed out bleakness of peat hags and tired grass among lonely hills where spring comes late and life is a struggle. The peat sog of these two great uplands is a source of many Devon rivers. Below the hills, where only isolated thorns survive, there are three ancient oak woodlands. Wisman's is the largest. Its stunted trees grow among the boulder glitter in the West Dart Valley under Bear Down. The branches and boles are covered in epiphytic ferns, mosses and lichens. The woods of the lower valleys, with their great stands of coppice oak and beeches, come into leaf far sooner. 
sheltering the frail beauty of wood anemones and a wealth of other spring flowers. Down river, the trickle from the peat bogs has broadened to a powerful flow, fed by scores of small streams bursting off the upland. The season has also noticeably strengthened, and its little miracles of light live in leaf and water. The delicacy of these Dartmoor flowers could not survive the uncompromising assault of the hill weather, which writes its own landscapes and landscape moods. One of the things Dartmoor is really famous for is the bog. There are four main types. There's the blanket bogs on the higher ground. There's the raised bog. There's the feather bed bog, little green thing. And there's this, the valley bog. I'm standing on a raft of vegetation, mostly of peat mosses like sphagnum that have been built up over the years. This is a classic example of the valley bog. It was formed over hundreds of years when the stream coming down from the top of the valley changed direction and left channels. And these channels silted over until eventually the whole of the valley was one vast bog. It's one large crust and underneath it is a peaty gruel. This couldn't have been formed without some sort of platform or granite below. But how far down is that granite platform? In stories by people like Conan Doyle, about Sherlock Holmes, the bog is that sinister unknown quantity. Well, I'm about to probe that unknown quantity now. The last thing in the world I want is to join this pole as it goes down into those black depths. Well, not very spectacular here, but there are places I'm sure where this will vanish entirely. <laughs> 